Morning, friends. Morning. It's good to see everybody today. We have some great music for you today. We're going to start out with a Blessed Be Your Name. Um, it is a prayer. I, if it's not familiar with you or to you, you'll find it's interesting that um, every other verse presents a different scenario in which we should be thankful. Um, and um, because not all of life is easy, um, sometimes we have to be thankful when life is hard. So I encourage you to read as well as sing the, the words to the song with your heart. Um, you'll, uh, you'll see the words on the screen. And... Uh, Welcome to worship today. today. Welcome to worship at Road to Emmaus Church, where we, uh, together, we have heart for the Harrisburg area, and we make new and growing disciples of Jesus Christ. It's good to see all of you here, and we also welcome all of you who are worshiping with us at home online um, we have uh, prayer request cards in 
the back seat backs if you need to um, have if you have a request for prayer or uh, either a, a joy or something that uh, concerns you a need or whatever and if you're at home feel free to call the church office contact us uh, by email or whatever and let us know your needs we also have if there are visitors visitors cards that uh, you could fill out and put uh, either give to pastor Wayne or put in the box with a slot out there uh, so that we can get to know you better so we're glad to have you all here worshiping um, please Join me in our call to worship. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let's stand and sing Morning Has Broken, number 469 in the Blue Hymnal. And, and we've chosen to do the Cat Stevens version with you this morning, just to bring a little bit of uh, uh, diversity here to our music. So uh, we welcome, we hope that you will enjoy it. And please feel free to worship in the way that feels most natural to you. It is okay to raise your hands here. You can put your palms out. You can simply stand and worship. You don't have to sing, just use your heart. Whatever you wish.
One thing is for sure in this life, at least in my life, um, I'm always going to have something to confess. Uh, so I have a feeling we're all in the same boat. So would you please join me in the prayer of confession and let's get our hearts right with God. Forgive us, God, for our complacent attitudes and self-serving comforts. We do not relish the thought of sacrificing for some larger good we cannot see for people with whom we find it difficult to identify. We compare ourselves favorably against many who seem less attuned to your purposes than we, forgetting that our true standard is Jesus. We ask you to take from us all the bitterness, envy, and anger that stands in the way of your reign. May all we ask of you be for the common good of all your children. Amen. In hope we are saved. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, intercedes for us, and guides us into all truth. God seeks to restore us to the fullness of life, to offer us hope, to assure us of our worth and our value. Feel the presence of God's blessing resting on you, empowering you to love and serve in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, our next song is Pur Purify My Heart. Yes, on the screen. Pure. Purify my heart. Let me be as whole and precious silver. Purify.
Please be seated. Before the scripture, let's join in prayer. Sovereign God, come among us to guide us in the footsteps of Jesus. Amaze and astonish us with the gifts already present among us. Um, awaken us to your rule. Fill us with new life and vigorous hope. May our meditations be pleasing to you and our service to others be the seeds of your kingdom, that your great and glorious day may be realized in our midst. Amen. I'll be reading Psalm 1, and I've read this many times because I tend to resolve to read all the Psalms, and then I start out really well and don't necessarily finish but Psalm 1 is one I always definitely get to. So it's a really good one, too. The more you read it, the more you like it. So, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Marcia. Uh, let's stand and uh, shake a hand, greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. And also while you're doing that, let me let you know, we're going to have an offering, children's offering. They, okay, they can. Okay. All right. Check, check, one, two. Uh, while you're taking your seats, uh, just right after the children's message, the kids are going to take our first return to our Joyful Noise offering. Now, you might not have coins with you today, but dollars will work too. So we'll be taking our, our offering for our American Indian Christian Mission in Arizona. Thank you. Hi, Zach, Olivia, Maria. I'm going to need your help today. I, we're going to be talking about a beetle, an insect. And I printed off some really large pictures from the internet that I'm hoping will show up on the screen for the people at home. If not, we'll have to readjust somehow. So this is the first one. Zach, you want to hold up this? Let's see, can, can, does it show up over... For people. Hold it still for just one second right there. That's great. That's great. Thanks. Zach, you can sit down. So the million dollar question is what does this beetle and a tube of glow sticks have in common? It's a hard one. Anybody from the audience? Lightning bugs? There you go. Yes, lightning bugs. So here, you wanna Olivia, you wanna hold up the picture of the lightning bug? This is the first one. Nice and tall. Nice <laughs> now, Becky, Mrs. Lowe would appreciate this. Glow sticks were invented by some very smart chemists who looked at how the lightning bug makes light glow to create it for the glow sticks. But all this ultimately comes from God. When we look at God's creation and God's nature, everything is amazing. The prophet Isaiah said that, not Isaiah, Job, the fish of the air, the birds, and even the earth all show God's handiwork. Now with the lightning bug, the light shines at underneath the abdomen. So the wings hide it, but here's a picture of it, creepy picture of it. You wanna hold this one up, Maria? <laughs> Okay. 
see how they like those underneath which is why when it's flying and it opens its wings we can see the light at night how many of you have ever thanks how many of you have ever caught lightning bugs yeah have you ever had the chance to do that olivia yes your parents are saying yes <laughs> Well, my grandchildren live in Colorado, and a couple years ago, they came in summer, and my son was really excited because they would see lightning bugs for the first time. Apparently, there are no lightning bugs in Colorado. It's too dry, but throughout most of the world, there are lightning bugs or fireflies that live everywhere where there's green grass and green trees especially all the tropical places and all the eastern places. So most of it's just where there's not enough water, where there's no green grass, because the adults, the adults eat pollen from the flowers and nectars that come along with the rain. So I did a little research about lightning bugs this week. There are over 2,000 different species. I had no idea. And they not only glow when they're adults, but the eggs glow. They lay their eggs in the ground and they glow and a tiny little worm comes out called a larvae. And here's a picture. Once again, it's blown up really, really big. Okay, Sack, here's the last picture. Oops. Here's the, uh, the larvae. So it looks like the tail is illuminating and the eyes are up here. So this little creature eats tiny little worms and insects that it finds in the ground. And it burrows deep, deep, deep in the ground. It lives there for 10 months. So in your backyard or front yard or anywhere, there could be lightning, the larvae living that won't come up until next year. And then the lightning bug itself only lives for three weeks. So it's really only a year for this insect. Now I want to talk to you about a light that never goes out. And that's the light of God and the light of Jesus and his love for us. Isaiah said in the Old Testament that God created us so his light could shine in us. And then in the New Testament, when we have Christmas, we celebrate that God sent his light down to earth through his son, Jesus Christ, who now lives in our hearts so that we can share his love with other people because God's love will never die. It's never going to go out. Praise God. That's the same. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful creation of nature. More marvelous, more than we can ever understand or know. Most of all, we thank you for your love that once again is so marvelous and so deep that we probably never will fully understand it until we get to heaven. And all kids said, Amen. Amen. All right, kids. Now, before you go far, we're going to take our coin mission for the American Indian Christian Mission. Rachel, would you come and help us take the offering? So, so grab your coins and dollars and uh, Zach and Rachel and Maria and... Livia, thank you. We'll, we'll go ahead and collect. And then kids, come on up and we're going to pray. Thank you, Ella. All right, kids, come on up. All right, let's dump them all into the one, put it into Rachel's pan, and then we're going to pray over that pan. There you go. Go ahead, Olivia. Put it right in there. Okay, come on over here, please. And let's pray. Let's, let's hold hands. I'll grab that. Oh, 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 there, there you go. Okay, let's go hold hands. Get Zach in there, too. There we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these coins and dollars and ask, Lord, that it would uh, support the, the, the growth and the education of our new fifth grade student that is at the American Indian Christian Mission. Thank you for all this. We pray it in Jesus' name. And God's kids said, Amen. Amen. All right, thank you guys very much. <clears throat> oh, 
I need a sermon before I get up to the <laughs> pulpit. There we go. There we go. I studied, but I didn't study that hard. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to turn now to our second Bible reading. This also from the Psalms. And uh, the key word that you should be looking for as we're talking about various things, and we heard it in Psalm 1 today, is the word blessed or bless. So uh, hear now the word of the Lord. <clears throat> be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises. That in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk in the pit that they have made, in the net that they hid. Their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's pray today. Oh, gracious God, we do thank you for your blessing. And we also thank you, Lord, for the warning of your word, the warning to those who would forget God. So teach us, Lord, your ways. Teach us how to recognize and celebrate your blessing in our lives. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let's continue our search for summer wisdom. Uh, we want to learn wisdom, of course, because we want to be known as wise people. We want to know that what we are doing and how we are operating in the world is wise. And so wise people possess sort of a practical knowledge for living life, this intelligence for living. And it, it facilitates, wisdom facilitates the, the way we operate this body and this life, this soul, this mind and heart that we have. So wisdom is like the operator's manual for the life that you live. It, it teaches us how to live life given the ups and downs and given the joys and stresses of life, it teaches us uh, how to live individually and in community. It is always a disciplined, thoughtful, loving, sort of long-term, sustainable arrangement for living. And so wisdom is good for us in all sorts of ways. But where do we find this wisdom? I was uh, thinking, I was reminded over and over again in my study this week uh, about that commercial for Tootsie Pops. You remember? Mr. Owl, how many licks does it take to get to the Tootsie Roll Center of a Tootsie Pop? Three. Well, actually, the answer is the world may never know. <laughs> That's the answer, according to the narrator, at least. Um, so, you know, who do we ask about wisdom? Not, certainly not Mr. Owl. He doesn't even know how many licks it takes because he bites too soon. And so, of course, we go to God for wisdom. And uh, I've shown you this uh, verse a couple of times already. It just strikes me as being so important that we recognize that Jesus says to us, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And there you find rest for your souls. So the unwise person is sort of frenetically grasping after life. They seek after um, so many things, grabbing for themselves, taking for themselves what they think they need. But the, the wise person learns from Jesus and has rest for their souls. It's such a great promise. And so wisdom is found, uh, I think, first and primarily, um, I would proclaim this as true in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is first where we find wisdom. And of course, this wisdom is taught by God's word, the Bible. And specifically, we can read from this wisdom literature that we're focusing in on this summer. And just as a reminder, though it's the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And those are going to be the places that we're looking for this wisdom. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in Job for a while. And there, 
we, we recognize that Job is a person that is in some ways symbolic of the unrelenting suffering that each of us will experience. A um, friend of ours once said that, hey, you guys are going to go either, you're either going into crisis, you're in crisis or coming out of it, or you're going into it. You know, you're into one of these phases of crisis in your life. It is, there are no exceptions in this regard. Uh, and so the one way that a lot of people uh, handle this unrelenting suffering in their lives is to say God has fallen down on the job or God has does not exist to kind of curse God and let the chips fall where they may. And this is exactly what Satan wants. When we hear in the very beginnings of the book of Job that that Satan is going to and fro across the earth, he is looking for souls who are in this very position in order to consume them for himself. So that's one of the things that we learn. Now, that is Satan's purpose for your suffering, but God has a purpose for your suffering as well. That you uh, might um, walk with him through suffering so that you will grow in faith and be strengthened so that you will have a growing resilience to survive and thrive through your suffering, whatever your suffering is. So that was from the book of Job. Last week, we talked about uh, the Psalms of praise, and we discovered that in a lot of ways, um, our uh, practice of praise, our habits of praising God uh, are for our wisdom. They, one of the things that that does in our life is to grow us in wisdom. And we talked about five ways. Very quickly, they are that praise brings us to a place of humility before God. That is a wise thing. Praise refocuses our attention from self onto God and others. That is a wise thing. Praise uh, causes Satan to flee from our lives because we are so focused on God. That is a wise thing. Praise leaves no room for complaining or negativity because we're, we're constantly um, thanking God for his goodness in our lives. That is a wise thing. And praise draws a group of people together as they focus in on one. It becomes the point of our unity amid all of the differences that our lives uh, may may have today. And so these psalms of praise give words to this practice of wisdom. It gives action and helps enable wisdom in our lives. Just a quick reminder of that from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. benefits. He who forgives all your sin, your iniquity, who deals with all your diseases, who redeems your life, from the pit, from death itself, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. This is a great promise, is it not? It is. And so the book of Psalms, again, just another quick reminder of a few nuts and bolts thing before we really dig in here. It's the longest book of the Bible, 150 chapters. Uh, the Hebrew word that underpins the word Psalms means book of praises. Uh, there's a, a slim majority of those that are written by the King David, or at least attributed to him. The rest by a variety of other authors. The Psalms include Psalms of lament, Psalms of festival, Psalms of praise and thanksgiving, Psalms of deliverance, Psalms for royalty, and a couple of other categories as well. They, uh, they include in them the full range of human emotions. So you're going to find sadness and joy there. You're going to find um, gladness and pain. You're going to find struggle and and, and celebration, all kinds of various things. Um, and then today we are searching for wisdom in the Psalms of blessing and of perishing. And so you saw that in within the body of Psalm 1, as Marcia read it to us, but we also see it here in the, in the passage that I picked to read second, uh, Psalm 9, that there's quite a lot of warning about this perishing part. So, uh, Let's uh, look into blessing and perishing, particularly in Psalm 1. So when we talk about blessing in the Bible, we should recognize um, a couple of really important things. And the, the first is that uh, the most uh, often time you hear of blessing is when? When someone sneezes, right? But you, God bless you. That's the, when the word leaps out of your mouth. I think that's most often the time that it is used. And so this, uh, there, there had been a tradition in the age before uh, modern medicine when, it, when you had um, some sneezes happening, uh, 
it, it might mean that you caught something that will kill you. And so <laughs> there was this immediate call upon God to bless that person who is sneezing. Uh, but, you know, if we use it so often, then I think we do so almost rather mindlessly these days. It's just sort of a knee-jerk reaction when someone sneezes. <clears throat> we should fix that, of course. Um, but blessing, as it turns out, if you were to try to flip through the scriptures and say, where is that defined? You know, you can't look up underneath the B's and then L and, you know, so on and find blessing, noun, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what we do get a lot in the Bible is a lot of description of the life that is blessed. And so when, when we bless the Lord, because this is one of the ways in which we are called to bless, when we bless the Lord, uh, we are giving honor and praise that is due his name. And so you see that here in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, for I have forgotten not all his benefits. And so my heart sort of leaps in praise and honor in blessing the Lord. Uh, and I, it should be uh, well known in our lives that uh, God is not going on an ego trip in this regard. It, it just simply is the fact that he is worthy the honor do his name. So it's just a simple fact. He's not trying to puff himself up in any way. There's a couple of verses that, that might confirm this idea here at Psalm 50. Uh, we read at verse 10, the, every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. Uh, this is speaking to the act of sacrifice and the various things that the Jewish people were called to give to the Lord. And they rather did so half-heartedly, if heartedly at all. And God says, I don't need that stuff. It's not about my needing a cow. It is about your giving yourself to me in, in an act of praise. And so don't think that you owe God anything that he does not already own, have in his possession. And so when we are blessing God, we are giving him the affection and honor and recognizing before him that everything is his, our very lives as well, our very lives as well. So when we are blessed by God, when we know blessing in our lives, it looks a little bit like this. Here are four quick verses from the Psalms. Blessed is the man, the woman, who takes, who makes, rather, the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after lie. Here's another example, Psalm 41. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. Another example, Psalm 65. Blessed is the one you choose, you, God, choose to bring near, to dwell in your courts, O God. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. And then finally, this example, Psalm 67, verse 6. The earth has yielded, it yielded its increase, God. Our God shall bless us. <clears throat> and so, particularly in this last example, when God blesses us, it is often because he has provided what we needed for our daily lives, uh, our daily bread, if you will. He gives this to us both for the here and now and for the eternity that we are called to in heaven. And so he gives us our daily bread. We, read, we, we say that in the Lord's Prayer uh, each time we, we recite that prayer. But you, we have, should also recognize that, of course, we are given much more than what we absolutely need for today. He certainly promises that. But so often our, our lives are blessed with more than that. Uh, we need to very specifically see that God's blessing is much, much more than we actually can conceive of with our brains. Uh, for example, here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, this is a, a, a moment of benediction uh, in, in uh, the end, well, not in the very end of the book, but a moment when Paul's heart just flows out and he says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we could ever ask or think. He wants to bless you more than you can conceive of, according to the Apostle Paul. And so on those days when we have been so blessed in these sort of overflowing ways, we need to bless God in return. We need to do that. It is a wise thing. And 
on those days when we got from the world far less than we expected, we are still nevertheless blessed. And of course, this is the, the, the amazing message of Jesus in the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so the blessing of God is known particularly on those days of deficit, those days of loss, those days when our hearts or perhaps even our bellies are hungering. God will bless. So blessing is something like God's unmerited favor. If I were to give you a three word definition of blessing, I think that one might suffice. God's unmerited favor favor. That is to say, it's given from God. It is something that we did not earn. We don't deserve it. It is completely unfair in this regard that we get more than we deserve. Remembering that he loves us. Why? Because he loves us. That's right. He loves us because he loves us for no other reason. So wisdom recognizes that God's blessing is present in both the joys and the difficulties of life. It's a both and. And so uh, in the wisdom literature specifically, we see something um, that uh, I'd like to highlight for you today. And particularly in Psalm 1, that is that uh, life is a journey, if you will, that offers you and me two different roads and really only two different roads. And this is an idea that's a little bit offensive to the current culture, uh, to the modern mind. Um, it, it used to be in, in the old days, you know, when we watched TV and there were good guys and bad guys, we knew exactly who they were, right? We knew, give me an example of a good guy. The white, okay, the white knight, who else? Lone Ranger. Now give me an example of a bad guy. Hitler is a bad guy. Uh, he didn't have his own TV show. The Village, yeah, right, right, yes, that's right. And so we uh, we knew who the good guys in and the bad guys were. And in watching the story unfold, we knew exactly who was who. But now um, the bad guys are likable, and the good guys have a dark side, right? All of this, these stories have that kind of thing going on. There are all these uh, grays that are going on. Uh, the prota protagonist has done the wrong thing for the right reason and still gets the girl. Uh, you know, this is how the, the stories that we are exposed to are told these days. Now, the world that we now live in tells us that what was uh, originally thought of as sin is now part of a person's identity. And the rest of us have to spend a whole month uh, celebrating the pride found in that identity. Uh, now, I, I'm, I'm going to go into a few things here, and I don't want anyone who is watching here in the congregation, uh, in the building, or online to get something confused. I do not hate gay people. I love people who are children of God, regardless of how they are currently identifying themselves. This is not about hate in any way. I just wanted to make that known. Uh, but uh, there is certainly true at one time, and I think still true today, but not universally so, that right and wrong were known to us as they were defined to us by God. But there's been a shift, a significant shift, the shift that, uh, that the, um, the perception of right and wrong is now culturally defined or even individually defined. And so what is right for me, I will do, but it may not be right for you. Uh, and so uh, what we find now is that rioting and pillaging are granted approval as part of some cultural movement because culture is moving in a particular way. Those things are given sanction. But the scriptures tell us that there are two ways. There's uh, two perceptions of reality. There's one in which God defines us and one in which we define us. There are two conflicting kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God, and there's the kingdom of the world that includes evil, Satan. There are two entry points. There's a wide gate leading to destruction and a narrow gate leading to life. 
And Psalm 1 is structured in this very way. There is uh, one person who is choosing God's blessing and choosing to be planted in the place of God's blessing and another who is choosing wickedness, who is being driven by the wind. So the first thing we learn about the blessed person is what he or she rejects. Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. One of the interesting things about this very first verse is that there are three increasing, uh, three verbs of increasing intensity. There is a, 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 this walking who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the seat of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Uh, you know, when you've sat down in front of something that you're not supposed to be looking at, uh, you've bought in. And so uh, this is uh, analogous for this ever deepening acceptance in our own life, in our own thinking, in our own hearts of rebellion. In the first place, there's the consideration of what the wicked think, the counsel of the wicked. The person's considering that, thinking about it. This is what it means to kind of walk around this thing. Uh, in the second place, uh, it is to do what sinners do. I've stood in that spot. And then lastly, in the third place, it is a belonging to those who would ridicule the very idea of God. To sit there and be part, to belong to that. So the blessed person does not soak in these ideas and eval the values of a culture that think God irrelevant. He does not, she does not conform to the ever-shifting morality uh, of the world. Uh, there is a line drawn that is not crossed, and, and it has to do with certain entertainments or interactions or humor or habits or liaisons or whatever it might be that we could make a rather long list. That blessed person does not put their head in the sand either to hide from the world's problems, but it is simply that the, this person, this blessed person, does not allow the world to shape them, to shape how they think, to shape how they behave, or who they belong to. The blessed person belongs to God. They delight in the law of the Lord. They are aware of God's intentions. Um, and so their presence in culture is, is not that we might be, our pre presence in culture is not that we would be conformed to it, but that actually we would shed light and salt on it, that we would give it a certain flavor, that we would let people see the light of God's word. Now, this will mean that there are a lot of times that you're not going to fit in. And so if that's what you want, this isn't the way to go. There are a lot of times when you will not fit in. The crowd is going to reject you because you didn't laugh at their jokes or you didn't go where they go after hours. It's just the way it is. It's not going to feel good, but that's the way it is. There will be times, however, less often, but sometimes, that whatever weirdness you have because you are a, a Jesus freak, or you go to church, or whatever people will call you because of what you know to be true by faith in Jesus. That weirdness in their eyes will be appreciated, especially as you offer to pray for them, as you help them out with something that they need help on. Um, they will want to know something more about what you know to be true, why you are blessed in life. And so, your blessedness is steady in the shifts of culture and it has a particular influence on it. And so the blessed man enjoys a few things as well. He, she is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf doesn't wither and in all he does, she does, they prosper. And so there's something here in each of these little phrases that we should notice. First of all, this tree is planted. It was not a random sprouting. Someone paid attention to where this tree would be planted. And it is planted in the place where there's water and nourishment so that the tree may grow. And so that it might grow, not just so that it might exist to itself, but so that it would bear fruit for the world around it. So it is a giving tree as well. 
And it is able to survive when the stresses come. Its leaf does not wither when it gets dry. And in all that he does, he prospers. Now, I think it's important to talk about prosperity here for a minute because there's a lot of confusion out there about what prosperity is in a, in a Christian worldview. Uh, we prosper, according to the scripture, this happens all over again, all over the, 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 the scriptures. And it's not specifically about wealth or owning a lot of things. Um, and we think of poverty as a state of owning very little. Uh, but all of creation, as we've already seen from Psalm 50, all the material things are made by God and belong to God already. And so everything that we can have and possess is really God's. When we um, have a sense of ownership of them, that really means that we're just stewards of them for a time. We just, we just have them for a time. God has entrusted them to us for a time. But in the Beatitudes, we hear Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we might ask what a poor spirit is. A poor spirit is one who operates out of want and desperation. They, they believe themselves to have little to have, or nothing. It, it focuses on what it doesn't have. There's no gratitude or thanksgiving. There's no joy or gladness or kindness to another because there's no resource for that kindness in themselves. But Jesus wants to bless that person and rather than making them poor in spirit, to make them rich in spirit. Jesus wants to give his blessing to that person. And so the answer to that person's spiritual problem is not money. The problem is, or the problem is not money and the answer is not money. The answer is a salvation that knows that there is nothing in all of creation, no poverty, no want, no need, no sickness, no pain that shall be able to separate us from eternal life that is known in Christ Jesus. And so we might be short on cash right now, but we are rich in eternity. In Jesus' salvation, we are promised that we do not belong to this world. And it's only for a time. This is not our home. We have an eternal life that is our home where there is no want or pain. Amen? Amen. Hope that makes sense. Here in Ephesians chapter 1, we get a sense of that. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. So it should be said, however, um, and I, I think this is, a, this is a, uh, just a little word of hope for the here and now. In that it, as, as our faithfulness to God grows and as our disciplines grow, particularly around money, wisdom, the wisdom of God through our disciplined interaction with money often leads to financial stability. It may not mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, cars and yachts, but it, it will mean uh, in most cases a financial stability. So there is a word of hope to those who are feeling poor financially. The Lord wants to speak to that. All right, so this is all about blessing and prosperity. And now we have to kind of flip the coin a little bit where we read, the wicked are not so. All right, the wicked. What's your mental image of the wicked? We uh, might think of a few things. Any, any thoughts? Who's the wicked one? A witch, all right. I thought of Cruella de Vil. Or the joker uh, but uh psalm one said the wicked are like chaff and so we have to be careful not to get to um, um uh, get this image overcooked too much uh, because when we hear that word wicked we tend to overcook the word a little bit so let's see if we can um, get a little more accurate about that the wicked psalm one says are like chaff now Here's a, an example of how wheat is winnowed, that it, how it is separated. Um, in a stiff wind, the wheat is thrown up, and what you see blowing this way are the inedible parts, the hulls and the stalks and things, but the heavier kernels, the wheat will fall down to the ground. It's a little obscured in this picture, but underneath that big cloud of stuff, there is a pile of wheat that will be saved the rest is going to blow away and it will be burnt. And so um, this is a picture of the two kinds of people here. Uh, there are those who are uh, 
uh, uh, the, the part that God wants to retain. And there's a part that chooses to live apart from God uh, that is blown away. Now, there are people, of course, who have planted themselves by the streams of water. And there are people who, we all know, live their lives apart from God. They have no interest in knowing God. They have no interest in understanding God's design or his word, um, how to apply those things to human living. Uh, they live, uh, for the most part, as the most important being in their own world, at least in terms of them calling their own shots for what they will do and what they will not do, the masters of their own little universe. Now, our modern sensibilities might think it an overstatement, but this is the person who is called wicked. Now, again, we have to make sure that we don't overcook this. And I'm going to show you a video that I found this week of something that was just released, and there are no really young kids in the congregation right now. And so uh, hold on for a second as you watch this. Oh. You fight against our rights You say we all lead lives you can't respect But you're just frightened You think that we'll corrupt your kids If our agenda goes unchecked It's funny, just this once, you're correct We'll convert your children Happens bit by bit quietly and subtly and you will barely notice it you can keep him from disco warn about san francisco make him wear pleated pants we don't care we'll convert your children we'll make them tolerant and fair I'd love to know what you think about that uh, after worship because there's probably a lot of things rolling around your head right now uh, in regard to that um, wickedness you know there's there's probably a lot of people that you just saw the vision of there who are in general good people uh, who you know are kind of animals and trying to save the earth and give to charity and and so on uh, but the bottom line of passages in the scriptures like Psalm 1 is that we are of one of two. We are one of two possibilities. We are blessed or we are wicked. And there's nothing in between. And so when we decide to no longer live our lives in reference to God and God's will, that is the wicked person. Now, we need to be nice to these people. We need to love them with the love of Christ. That is absolutely true. But being a nice person will never overcome the rejection of God and God's love. There will never be enough niceness or fairness to overcome that. And that is what wickedness is. And the result, of course, is what we read in Psalm 1. They will not stand in the judgment. Now, what that means is that they will have nothing to stand on in the judgment. In other words, in judgment, they will fall. They will not be among the congregation of the righteous. None of us are righteous of our own accord, of our own ability, but our righteousness comes from the righteousness given by Jesus. And that righteousness is ours. And their ways will perish. So I've left you with a lot of heavy stuff here at the, the very end here, but I want you to take positively this idea that the wisdom of knowing your blessedness comes as we plant ourselves beside God's stream, as we plant ourselves by that living water in the good soil, in God's word, and in the fellowship of his people. That blessedness is yours. And I hope that you will know it and receive it and give thanks for it. But the wicked 
uh, choose to do it on their own, apart from God. They will choose their own identity. They will choose their own morality. Uh, they will try to impose it on the rest of us as well. But it is chaff in the wind, and it comes and it goes. It's destroyed by its own empty hull. The wise choose to be planted in the place of God's blessing that is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We choose for ourselves to be in the place of God's nurture and instruction. And there you will flourish and be blessed and bear fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we uh, think uh, heavy thoughts at the moment about the state of the world in which there is quite a lot of folks that are moving headlong into the way of chaff to be blown away by the wind. And it, it feels so onerous uh, right now, having watched this video. So Lord, we do pray that we would renew our efforts to be people of blessing and to share this blessing of Christ. The blessing of Christ that, uh, that knows uh, its, um, its rootedness, that, that knows its flourishing, the, the kingdom of God flourishing. We just pray, Lord, today, these things for us and for those we love and those who you are called, uh, we are called to share it with. So we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, sing. Uh, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, number 345 in the bulletins, and it's also going to be on the screen. How are we going to do uh, all of them? Under, I'm sorry. Yes, I think they're all there. All right, please stand. our faith today as we say the words of uh, these, uh, this chunk of the eco-essential tenets together. The great purpose towards which each human life is drawn is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Each member of the church glorifies God by recognizing and naming His glory, which is the manifestation and revelation of His own nature. Each member of the church enjoys God by being so united with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit 
as to become a participant in that divine nature, transformed from one degree of glory to another, and escorted by Christ into the loving community of the Trinity. So we confess our faith, not as a matter of dispassionate intellectual assent, but rather as an act by which we give God glory and announce our membership in the body of Christ. We trust that when God's glory is so lifted up, and when His nature is thus made manifest in the life of the body, the Church will be a light that draws people from every tribe and tongue and nation to be reconciled to God. This is our prayer. Please be seated. Let's bow our heads. Oh, gracious God, we thank you, Lord, that you have shown us in your word these two paths, these two ways of living. And uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, we, we might not get caught up in the, the little minutiae between each of these things that the world suggests are okay. We ask, Lord, today that we might be your people, that we might have a clarity in our living, that we might commit ourselves to your way and to your kingdom and know your blessing in our lives. For we do give thanks for it and praise you for uh, you are worthy to bless us and only you. So be with us as we navigate the intricacies of, of living life. And, um, and I pray, Lord, today for any person that might be uh, watching this sermon uh, who uh, may be uh, offended uh, or who is uh, just worried about uh, the tenor of these words. I just ask, Lord, that you would be with that person and that you would remind them of your great love for them, for all and that we might call on your name in, in, with a, an honesty and with a, an intent. So, Lord, thank you. Uh, we pray, Lord, today for Mike Weaver and ask that you would be with him as he continues to walk through uh, the, the journey of being treated for cancer. We ask, Lord, today that you'd be with Michael Singley as he travels to this Coast Guard camp, that it would be a good experience for him, that it would confirm uh, and bring clarity to the call to serve in the military. We ask today that you'd be with Kurt's mom as she is having a biopsy and is facing a number of health issues. So, so be with her for healing and for peace. We ask the same today for Lindsay, who's uh, going to be having surgery, brain surgery, uh, here in, uh, in a little while. So be with her, um, especially as uh, she is a new mom and, and uh, is far away from, from home uh, on the West Coast, so be with Lindsay and with Evan as they handle this situation. We pray for a person named Sue, whose husband and son have, uh, stepson have recently died, so uh, be with her grief, but also be with her as she must battle cancer, and so watch over her too. Protect her today, provide a hedge of protection around her soul, her mind, her spirit. And of course, we do pray for the Ewing family, as uh, Chris is now. Uh, in the heaven promise to her. So be with, uh, with Chris's daughter, particularly, and her family. And be today with Leanne Schweer as her mom has passed as well. We thank you, Lord, for Joan's great faith, the sure knowledge of heaven. And we ask now, Lord, that as Leanne will be settling into a new way of life, that you would bless and protect her as well. These things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn. You'll notice the tune being Amazing Grace, uh, but the words will be a setting of the first psalm that we just studied. Let's stand. <laughs>
seated for just one second. And we have a couple of announcements today. If you need a moment of prayer after worship, I'd be happy to gather with you. I'll be here up front for a few minutes to, to pray with you. Uh, our Tuesdays together continue, although I just learned that our next episode is the last episode of season two of The Chosen. And so uh, we'll have two more weeks of that. We're going to watch that episode and then discuss it the week after. And then we'll shift gears a little bit, but continue to, to meet for Tuesdays together. So bring your own dinner at six and uh, discussion and movie at seven. Uh, Saturday morning prayer is uh, still gathering and we'd be happy to have you come along uh, either by Zoom or in person here. Then we have prayer walk at nine if that sounds uh, more uh, interesting to you. Uh, deacons and elders and those of you who are on, including new ones, those of you who are on ministry teams, uh, you're invited to dinner uh, at Becky and my house. My Becky and my house. Yes, that's correct. I think uh, at, at uh, on the 19th at 6 p.m. We're going to have uh, some dinner and fellowship together and then we'll uh, go through some nuts and bolts uh, about uh, ministry in the fall. And I believe that is it. Anything to add today? Yes, go ahead, Peg. So there's a card for Leanne Schwer, uh, Joan's daughter, out on one of the tables by the coffee. Anything else for today? Then let's stand and hold a hand, please. Oh, gracious God, be with us now as we depart, depart from this place, as we go into the world. We ask, Lord, as that hymn just told us, that you would guard us as we go out into a culture uh, that uh, thinks, well, frankly, that we're crazy. Uh, and we ask, Lord, today that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And that as we go into the world and, and endeavor to be a part of culture that has an influence on it, that you would enable that and empower it and, and propel it into the world. So, so be with us in these things. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace.